Well, good morning. Let me ask you a quick question. How bright is your faith candle burning today? And as I talk about this, as we start out with 1 Thessalonians, we're going to be in chapter 1 today. Um, we're going to address that issue and kind of where we are with faith and hope especially and how God works through that. What's really cool about 1 Thessalonians is uh, Paul and Silas had been in jail. They'd gotten beat up. Uh, and then, uh, remember the, the, the uh, doors, they were singing and the doors of the jail opened and the jailer was going to commit suicide, and basically Paul said, hey, we're all here, don't do that. And then the jailer and his whole family came to Christ, but then the, uh, the uh, governor basically said, I want Paul out of town. And Paul said, oh, by the way, I'm a Roman citizen, so you beat me illegally. And Rome kind of looks down on mistreating their citizens, and so I'd like you to come and tell me to leave. And so the governor himself goes to Paul and Silas and says, uh, would you guys please leave? That would be great. So they go down, uh, 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 basically end up in Thessalonica, and that's where we get Thessalonians from. And so they're in Thessalonica. I can imagine what they look like. They probably look like MMA fighters. I'm guessing potato ears and you know cuts under their eyes, and they've been beaten. So I'm sure their, their faces are swollen. They look terrible. And Paul kind of references that idea through 1 Thessalonians. And so as he's talking to them, they can actually see this imagery. And so then what happens is, once again, trouble starts. And so Paul and Silas end up leaving the persecution that happens. But that church is continually persecuted because uh, uh, the Roman government and the people in charge of the government begin to think that uh, Christians are against their government. And so they basically begin punishing them for their beliefs. And, of course, uh, the guys who make uh, idols aren't happy uh, because now they're not getting income from their gold idols and all kind of things are going on. So uh, Paul and Silas leave and Timothy goes into town later and then gives a report to Paul how great the people are doing even in the middle of suffering. So that's the background, just a little bit of background of what's going on as we get to 1 Thessalonians. And, um, but I'm going to tell you an unbelievable story because those of you who know me now and didn't know me when I was younger will look at me and say, there is no way. And that is that in high school, I used to run track. Not only did I run track, I was one of the fastest kids in the school. Even as a freshman, I was the fourth fastest in my high school, which meant I got to do the 440 relay until I dropped the baton as a freshman. But that's another story for another day. But um, uh, then as a junior and senior, I ran in the 440 relay, and I, I, it was funny because I always joked that I had the records for my school, uh, but the reason I had the records is because they switched from yards to meters, and so I got all the records because there was no meters, so I was the first one on the board with records in the 100-meter 100 100 run instead of the 100-yard uh, uh, the dash, and so anyway, um, and so all those things, and and... I'll never forget, though, Coach Warner, who was your dad's roommate in college, by the way, Bill. Uh, Coach Warner would start us out, and the first day of track, people, there were only 400 people in my high school, but 100 kids every year, this happened every year, would show up the first day to run track. And Coach Warner would go, okay, we're going to run down to Wackenhut's Estate, and I don't know what it's called now, it has a different name, but you're going to run down there through the mangrove swamps in Miami, you can imagine what that was like, and over the bridge, down to Wackenhut's, down to the water, and back. That was a total of five miles. And even as a freshman in high school, that is a lot for your first day. So we would run the first day, and the next day, because a fourth of the school had run five miles the day before, you could literally hear people going down the stairs. Oh, 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 oh. And I can remember being, oh, I just untied my shoe. I can remember being, I can remember, through the, the bunny around, the, okay. I can remember being a freshman and being so sore 
I could hardly stand walking. And I remember coming out to track and thinking, okay, what are we doing today? I figured, you know, we had five miles yesterday, so it's going to be easier. The second day, only about 75 students showed up. All of a sudden, it was a lot less. And of course, because some of them couldn't walk. And uh, then the coach said, guess what we're doing today? We're like, what are we doing today? He's like, we're running to Wacken Hudson back. And we're like, no. And sure enough, we started running. Some of the kids cheated and immediately got kicked off the track team. So that narrowed it down a little bit because they would go halfway and then the first kid would head back and they would go the other way with the kid. And they didn't think the coach knew that, but he was there with his golf cart. Yeah, he wasn't running. Uh, anyway, so ran back and I'll never forget that third day. Usually we'd have maybe 50 kids, maybe 50 kids. And the third day, typically, he would then say, we're going to do whatever. Whatever it was, was much easier. I don't remember what it was. It might have been running in circles. It might have been toe touches. I don't know what it was, but we were so glad for that third day. But he had what done what? He found out who was going to be faithful, who was going to keep going when things got tough. And that's the story of faith for us, because real faith, true faith, Faith has some components. So we're going to talk about what that looks like today, and we're going to look at this idea of signs of true faith. So here's number one. Number one is it's active faith. So let's read this. If you have your Bibles, you can pick up with me. I would encourage you as we're going through this book of the Bible, the, uh, sometime at home this week, maybe this is the study for your week, do First Thessalonians chapter 1. Here we go. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, I already gave you the background about them, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, what I talked to the kids about, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for you and continually mention you in our prayers. Why? We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith. Now, I'm going to come back to that, so put that on the shelf, okay? Your work produced by faith. Your labor, and by the way, this word for labor is uh, like sorrow, like pain. Your labor prompted by love, and that's the word that many of you have heard, agape. So it's the deep love, the true love, or as they say in Princess Bride, true love. Sorry, I saw Princess Bride the other night. My son said they'll never be able to remake that movie. Who would you cast? Who would be Andre the Giant? There's just not. There's just not. The Rock doesn't work for that. He does every, he did every other role he'll take, but he can't take that one. All right. So, by love and your endurance. And the, remember the shoes? The endurance. By the way, endurance literally means to remain under something. It's like somebody putting a rock on you. You're having to hold something. Some of you are in that condition right now with something in your life. You're enduring. You're, you're feeling the pain of a financial issue, or you're feeling the pain of a physical issue, or an emotional issue, or you're dealing with a neighbor, or you're dealing with something at work, or you're dealing with whatever, and you are enduring, you are feeling the weight of that. That's what this means. And then it says, uh, uh, inspired, listen to this, by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So I talked to the kids earlier about grace and peace, and the truth is there's no peace without grace. Because when you think that you are earning your way to God, when you think the Christian life is about a list, and if you do this list, God loves you and he's happy with you, and if you don't get the list right, well, then God's displeased today, then you live under a constant threat of, well, if I don't quite make it today, God's not going to love me today. And when you recognize grace is about the fact that he is faithful, you ready? Even when you're not. And so it's about surrender all the time. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want you to hear me the wrong way. First John basically says, if you walk in darkness, you're not living in the truth, which essentially means if you're pursuing sin and you constantly pursue sin, then maybe, just maybe, you're not a believer. If, you're, if, you're, if you have no desire to follow God and you're pursuing whatever you want all the time, then the question is, have you ever really put your faith in Christ? And so this grace and peace idea is the idea when you understand you've been given grace, then you go through life understanding and having peace. Because you understand it's not based on works. It's not how much you do. By the way, this is the difference between Christianity because he says here your work... Produced by faith. 
every other religion says, you work and maybe, just maybe, you'll work your way into heaven. Or maybe, just maybe, if you do the, the pillars, if you do the tenets, if you do the, these things, then maybe, just maybe, God will accept you. And Christianity says the opposite. It says, because you've put your faith in Christ, because you're trusting God, because that candle has been lit, then works come out of your faith, not the other way around. And by the way, when we get it the other way around, we're miserable. When we think we're going to work to please God, when we think God's only going to be happy with us, when we get everything right, we're miserable. But when we understand and put our faith in him, what happens? The fruit comes naturally. I've got an orange tree in my yard. And uh, my orange tree has oranges on it. And this year I'm so excited. It's like the third year and it's finally got some good looking oranges on it. But I have a problem. The deer have discovered my orange tree. And they love the leaves off my orange tree. So they are jumping my fence, coming into my yard, and eating the leaves. And they, the leaves now, they're getting close to the oranges. And so, like, like, I'm wanting to get one of those automatic deer sprinklers to keep them away, right? But the truth is, I don't have to go out and say, now, orange tree, give me oranges, don't give me lemons. Because the orange tree, if it's healthy, if I provide the right environment for it, it will give oranges. Listen, if you are a believer and you are in love with Jesus and you're spending time with him, unless you've allowed something else to come in to stunt your growth, the fruit should be a natural byproduct of that. Here's what it says in James chapter 2. Jesus' brother, he knew a few things. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Which means when your faith is real, it's going to be natural to do the things God's called you to do. Does that mean you'll always feel like doing it? No, 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 no. How many of you in here work out? Right? Right? I have never in my life felt, ever felt like working out. And people would say to me, aren't you glad you went to the gym? And I'm like, no. They're like, what? What do you mean? I said, well, I, I had to go to the gym. Am I glad? No. I wish that I could just tell my body, you will be in shape. And that's all I had to do. But every time I had to get up. Now, the only person I've known that's the opposite of that is a guy named Rodney Walker. And I told him, we all hate you. Because he said, I love to run. And I said, you are broken. I don't know what's wrong with you, but that is not normal behavior. And the truth for most of us is, spiritually, we're kind of that way. There's times where we get up and we're like, oh, I don't want to. Or we just get distracted. We're so busy in our lives doing other things that we've not taken time to just get still and allow God to help our faith be active. So it's active faith. Number two, it's tested faith. One of my favorite scenes in Indiana Jones is Indiana Jones Part Three with with uh, what's his name, his dad, the one that's in the the one Sean Connery who's in the submarine most of the time. Anyway, so um, not in that movie, but anyway, so there's a scene where it says, "Take a step of faith," and he's looking out at this cavern, and he goes, "I know I'm supposed to take a step of faith," and he sees nothing except I'm going to fall to my death. And so he raises his foot, and he takes that step of faith, and then they show a side angle, and there's actually a bridge that you can't see that he steps onto. I know from my own life that that step of faith has happened to me over and over and over again. Any time that I felt like God wants me to do something, God wants us to step out, he wants me to... Typically, it's how are we going to do that? And most of the time, my answer is, I have no idea. Come on, Eric, you're the leader. What are we going to do? I don't know. This week, Steve texted me. He said, Eric, what is our vision plan? And I said, well, you know, I have a vision statement. I don't really have a vision plan. And then he wrote back, no, no, I mean, what kind of eye insurance do you have? <laughs> I felt much better about that question. First Thessalonians, first, 
I don't know. First, isn't that funny? First Thessalonians, because I, I was feeling guilty, like I really need to have a vision plan. He's like, you do have one. Okay, so uh, First Thessalonians 1, 4 through 7 says this. For we know, brothers and sisters, listen to this, listen to this. If you don't hear anything else this week, get these three words in your head. Loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel, that's where we get the word evangelism, our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. So you realize, and God puts it in your heart, what you want to change, who you want to be, what he's doing in your life. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcome the message, listen to this, in the midst of severe suffering. By the way, when people say the church in America is suffering, I'm like, with, with what? I mean, when the air goes out, we get upset. When the phones go down, <clears throat> we get upset. With the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. But why? Because here they were suffering and yet they continued to do what God wanted them to do. So in other cities where they weren't being punished for their faith. When they weren't really suffering for their faith. They looked at them and they said, wow. If they can stand up under that. If God gives them joy in prison. If God gives them joy in the middle of that struggle, wow, what an example to us. One of the things I would challenge you to do is get around somebody who's got joy. If you're struggling in your faith, get around another believer who can encourage and be an example to you of God's joy. Sometimes the best thing you can do when you're struggling and when your hope candle seems to be going out is to get around somebody whose light is burning brightly. Now, let me tell you something about this hope candle that I know that you don't know. Have you ever had somebody put trick candles on your cake? Anybody ever had that? Come on. Right? And now you could identify trick candles. Like if somebody did it now, you know exactly what they look like. They go the whole time. And what happens? You get the trick candle and you blow across the top of the cake, which my mother hates. She wants to use a plate because she doesn't want us. She won't eat the cake if somebody blows it out because I have nephews. You should see it. No, no, you can have the whole cake. It's all yours. You take it home, right? So you blow the candles out, right? And the, can the candles go out. And then... If you're like me, you have 55 candles. Right? And you look and they're all back on. Listen, the good news about faith in Christ is that it may feel like it's out sometimes. It may feel dark. You may go through a season where you feel like, I feel so far from God. I feel such difficulty. There's so much going on. But, but through hope, as God puts hope in your life, that, that candle will relight. Listen to this. Romans 5, 3 through 5 says it this way. Not only so, but we glory in our sufferings. I don't know about you, I don't. Like if somebody says, how are you doing? And I'm not having a good day. I'm just like, it's awful. The worst. Hate it. Right? Am I supposed to go, I'm just glorying in Jesus. Right? Okay, church lady. Right? And then it says, why? Because we know that suffering produces what? Relighting of the candles. Perseverance. Perseverance, character. Character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So listen, if you're right now under a circumstance that is squishing the candle of your life, I want to encourage you to begin to say, God, would you give me hope? Because the opposite of discouragement and the opposite of giving up is to recognize, God, I know that you're going to see me through this. By the way, you don't have to like it. Like when somebody says, how you doing? You're like, terrible, it's awesome. You don't, don't be a crazy person, okay? We have medicine for that, right? 
But the truth is, whatever you're going through, you say, God, you know what? I don't understand, but I trust you. God, I don't understand what you're doing, but I trust you. But if you're like me, and, and, and I know no one's like me, that's okay, but I try to be God. I read the Bible and I argue with God. Like, I hear the story of the angels telling Joseph, your wife, oh, excuse me, the angels don't come to him first. The angels first go to Mary, and they say, you're pregnant. And then Mary goes to Joseph and says, by the way, I'm pregnant. And Joseph's like, oh, she's crazy. Let's have her put away. And then the angel comes to Joseph. And I always say to God, hey, wouldn't it be better if you had told Joseph first? Wouldn't, wouldn't, I mean, I can, see, I can see in heaven, I can see God look at the angels and go, <laughs> watch this, go, go, tell, go tell Mary she's pregnant. No, 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 you mean tell Joseph? No, no, let's watch this, watch it, go tell Mary first. Did you see Joseph? Did he freak out or what? Wasn't that awesome? Okay, go tell Joseph, <laughs> right? If I was God, I'd be like, tell Joseph first, what's your problem? And here's the truth. Many times in life, I say, God, why are you doing this? I have a friend right now who's been a pastor for years. He, he serves in ministry now actively. He's a pastor of First Baptist Melbourne for years. His wife got a brain tumor. They found out because she had some, all of a sudden she started having some speech problems and some other problems, so they did a thing and she had brain cancer. They removed all the cancer and she went for therapy and the cancer came back and she's today home on hospice care. And I say, God, I know a lot of people that would be a lot better candidates for that. Is that me being mean? Absolutely, I'm being mean, right? We, we all know something. We're like, why, why a nice God? But you know what? I have to recognize, God, I don't understand. But your grace is sufficient. And it is. My friend is trusting God. His wife knows Jesus. Their family is Christian. They, they know that God is going to walk them through this. I would love to tell you why some people suffer and some people don't and how all that works, but I don't have the answer. But I trust the one who does. And probably when we get to heaven, people say, I'm going to have all kinds of questions for God. I have a feeling when we get to heaven, we're going to be like, this is so awesome. I don't care. <laughs> like, I could have got here earlier if I hadn't eaten so much fiber, Right? You never heard that joke? That's an old joke. <laughs> Hudson Taylor said this, I've seen many men work without praying, though I've never seen any good come out of it, but I've never seen a man pray without working. When you surrender to God, when you say, God, I want to follow you, when you spend time in his word, when you spend time in prayer, what happens? God transforms you, that candle lights, and you realize, God, what do you want me to do? And then you go and do. Number three, it's a trans forming faith. Some people realized this week very suddenly how attached to their phones they were. It was the weirdest thing because uh, I had uh, uh, internet service all day so that I didn't lose cell phone service. I had my mind so it did. So I didn't know there was a problem until about three or four in the afternoon, whatever day that was, Thursday, all of a sudden everyone else's texts came through like at one time asking me questions. And I'm thinking, I wonder how long ago they sent these questions for me that are urgent and I need to answer. Some people this week thought, well, I'm not that addicted to my phone <laughs> until all of a sudden their phone didn't work. And the truth is we don't realize sometimes what we're worshiping and what we're following until we can't. And then we recognize, God, I really need you. First. Listen to what it says here. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but, okay, but your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we don't need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. Remember, Paul and Silas beat up, and yet when they came to the early church, they took care of them. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from 
the coming wrath. What do he say? You put aside your idols. So the question for us is, do we have any idols in our lives? What are we pursuing? What matters the most to us? Are we willing to lay those things down and say, God, I want to serve you first? That's what they did. Others even heard about how they put away their false beliefs and followed God. Listen to what it says in Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. By the way, living sacrifice can crawl away. God, I need to stay and surrender myself to you, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Dr. Cloud, who wrote Boundaries, was talking about being on a plane with a guy and talking to him about faith in Christ. And the guy looked at Dr. Cloud and he said, I do not trust anyone. Why would I trust in Christ? And Dr. Cloud said, he tried not to, but he laughed out loud. And he said to the guy, do you realize we are 30,000 feet in the air? There's a pilot, hopefully, flying this plane. Some mechanic who may have had a bad day worked on this plane. There's some guy in a tower right now, hopefully with caffeine, keeping our plane going. You are trusting all kind of people. The question is, who are you going to trust? And that's true for all of us. I know that you're probably trustworthy, but we all know that there's times we can't even trust ourselves. So I want to encourage you to put your faith in Christ because here's what he does. When you put your hope in him, when you put your faith in him, even when you fail, even when you mess up, even when you blow it, even when you're disappointed, not only at the world, but yourself, he relights the candle anyway, and he helps you to put your hope in him. If you're here today and you've never put your hope in Christ, you've never trusted him, I'll be here after the service and you can say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ today. What do I need to do? Or maybe like somebody did last night, they said, you know what, I'm ready to take that next step. I want to be baptized. I want to take that step of faith. Maybe that's you today. I'd be glad to talk to you after the service about how we do that. Or maybe you're here today and you're a Christian and something else I talked about, you said, that was for me. Just be honest with God about it. Ask him to relight that hope and that faith in your heart. And if you're one of those that's under the burden, I want you to know you're not alone. There's a lot of us here who would love to help you to carry those burdens that God gives you, to be here for you, to let you know we love you and pray for you. So let us know. We'd be glad to do that for you. Let's close in prayer today, and then we're going to have our time of offering and a great song to close our service. Would you join me? Father, we put our hope in you. We put our trust in you. We put our faith in you. Lord, for those that are persevering today, whether they're dealing with a physical problem, an emotional issue, uh, Lord, maybe something huge in their lives, I pray right now that you would relight that candle of hope that they could persevere under trial, knowing that you are going to walk them through. Lord, we thank you for this time today. May you get the glory for all things. Lord, when we try to be boss and tell you how to live, I pray, and, and, and run the world, I pray that we would hope in you instead. Lord, thank you for this time today. Bless each one, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have our time of giving now. You give what God puts on your